Hi, I'm Aria, um, and thank you for having me today. Um, I'm the assistant curator of Net Art and Digital Culture at Rhizome, uh, which is a digital, a born digital institution based in New York, um, and we're loosely affiliated with the New Museum. Our focus is on digital art and culture. Um, we were founded 20 years ago in 1996 by Mark Tribe, an artist. Um, we were founded as a community-based organization. I think I'm like a community-based organization, and we still function as such, as a hub for artists and those interested in net art. Our website houses a rich and maze-like history of the world of net art. Our program these days consists mostly of publishing writing online, holding public programs, supporting artist projects, and staging online exhibitions. Our most recent and ambitious undertaking is a project called Net Art Anthology. This is the mi microsite for it. You can find it at anthology.rhizome.org. Um, we launched this project this October. Um, Net Art Anthology is a two-year online exhibition that endeavors to retell the story of Net Art, um, of Net Art history. And so at Rhizome, we define Net Art as um, art that acts on the network or is acted upon by the network. So it's sort of an expanded definition of Net Art um, rather than just browser-based artworks. It includes um, networked performances, um, objects that appear in real space but are connected to objects online, and so forth. Um, so this exhibition, over the course of the next two years, will restage and recontextualize one work per week on this microsite, which you can see here. Um, we're also publishing essays, interviews, and holding in-person panel discussions alongside the re-performances of these works. So the anthology will unfold in five chapters, and we're currently in the first chapter. Um, the first chapter is 1985 to 1998, which will represent the early web, and there are 20 works within each chapter of the um, exhibition. The 1999 to 2005, which is the era of flash and blogs. 2006 to 2011, the age of surf clubs, the birth of post-internet, and the rise of social media platforms. And four, 2012 through the present, well, which by that point will be 2018, since this goes for two years, um, which will represent mobile apps and social media saturation. And then the fifth chapter will be kind of going back to the beginning and filling in the gaps from 1985 to the present. Um, and so the works that we're choosing, and there's 100 works in total, and we're choosing them on a rolling, on a rolling basis, so um, we're open to submissions and suggestions from artists and practitioners. Um, which is part of our community-oriented approach to uh, exhibitions and publishing. Um, but the works included must use the internet in ways that, and first, the first criteria is that they must use the internet in ways that give expression to emerging subjectivities. The second is that they model new forms of collective cultural practice. The third is that they exemplify aesthetic, subjective, political, and conceptual positions that have taken on singular importance, or singular and profound resonance with, within particular networks of artists. And the final criteria is that they can be meaningfully restaged, reconstructed, or reperformed for this exhibition. So criteria number four is just what I'm gonna talk a bit about today. Um, so the question sort of that plagues us throughout this process is, what does it mean to restage, reconstruct, or reperform a work of net art? And more broadly, how do we go about preserving net art or digital art? So the preservation of digital art is arguably more difficult than that of other mediums like painting or sculpture. At the very least, it presents a di different related set of problems. The very existence of the digital art object is quite precarious, and the data that comprises it is easily erasable and manipulable. Further, it is up for debate what the object is exactly. Is it the code? Is it the appearance of the work in the interface? Art conservation at large must ask similar questions. The goal of the field appears to be to maintain, at times even produce, the utmost authenticity of the art object. There are different positions on how to achieve this. Should you privilege the will of the artist? What if their wishes for the work to decay over time? Should the goal be to present the work in a form as close as possible to that of its original staging, in some version retaining its aura to follow Walter Benjamin? It all feeds an underlying philosophical, ontological uncertainty about the boundaries of the art object. While these are certainly complex issues, they remain somewhat manageable when approaching a static object like a painting or a sculpture in the sense, if only, that you're dealing with identifiably material properties of an object. On the other hand, digital art, whose existence pretty much relies wholly on the hardware and software capabilities of its time, 
and the media and, platform, and media and platforms with life cycles of only a few years, it becomes quite a headache. So for example, there are countless flash animation-based works that are just not viewable in up-to-date browsers. One could attempt to reconstruct these works at the level of code, but that wouldn't be a long-term fix. Soon enough, the most up-to-date technology will become outdated. Um, a good example of this sort of problem broadly is Shuli Chang's Brandon, which is pictured here, um, the restoration, restoration of which the Guggenheim has undertaken in the last few years. Their method is seemingly something along these lines, updating it for a contemporary browser, but this is fairly labor intensive and as well requires maintenance after the fact. Another example, um, how do we deal with interactivity that is central to so many net art works? We can't present something like Olya Leolina's My Boyfriend Came Back from the War, which is pictured here um, in the NetArt Anthology interface. Um, we can't present this work as a video, for instance, where we watch someone navigate through the work because the central point of it is the interactivity, um, navigating through the multilinear hypertext narrative. Um, is that, yeah, that experience is central to the work, as is the user's voyeuristic engagement of the personal story. So presenting an even greater problem, and presenting even an even greater problem than um, my boyfriend came back from the war, or Brandon, are the works that we engage with that engage the network in more outright, performative, and dispersed ways. One example is Electronic Disturbance Theater's 1997 work Floodnet. Um, the work was a Java applet that would cause a web page to automatically reload itself over and over, crashing the site if it, crashing a given site if enough users attacked it. The applet was used to stage protests in solidarity with the Mexican Zapatista movement. Um, but Rhizome, of course, in 2016 especially, can't stage a DDoS attack in order to represent an artwork, um, especially on like a government website, um, hoping that they'll recognize it as art. So for Floodnet, the boundaries of the art object are nearly impossible to determine and extremely difficult to represent. So the question becomes, what do we do? <laughs> Our chosen method for attempting to preserve these works is of net art is emulation. Basically, instead of conserving individual objects, we aim to conserve legacy environments in which these objects and practices initially appeared. Old browsers like Netscape, for instance. Our head of preservation has been leading a small team in creating a tool called Old Web Today, which is found at oldweb.today, um, and you can access that. Um, and this is a lightweight in-browser emulation tool that mimics the interface and functionality of a given or um, out-of-date web browser. So for NetArt Anthology, this means that we can reach back into the archive and present early NetArt works that, as they appeared way back when. These are embedded on the, on the NetArt Anthology site using containerized browsers. So here you can see it. Uh, this is Antonio Mundata's The File Room, and um, it's just embedded on the website in this containerized browser, and you can navigate the, um, this project was an archive of censorship that you can navigate, and we've reconstructed um, the majority of the archive, and it's fully functional. Um, so there are a few reasons for choosing this approach. Um, it reflects our belief that digital culture is a series of practices rather than artifacts. We believe digital art to be inherently performative. At Rhizome, our approach for preserving works like this hinges on the idea that digital culture is a series, is a series of practices and artifacts. Context is key. In some ways, it is a repurposing of some of any means ideas in the work of art and age and mechanical reproduction. He wrote that the authenticity of the thing is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history it has experienced. We are interested in some sense in relocating what Benjamin amounted to what, what for Benjamin amounted to the authenticity and cult value of a given object to a place outside of the object itself, the circumstances within which it was nested originally. For us, preserving the authenticity of digital art means preserving the conditions in which it was intended to be experienced. Again, one could attempt to mimic this, creating bespoke environments for every work of net art that one wishes to preserve. However, again, as noted, this would be extremely labor intensive and thus limiting for the possibilities of preserving net art itself, basically just spending more time on fewer practices. Which brings me to a second reason for our use of emulation. We view the digital as a mass medium, as do many, if not most, of the artists we work with and whose work we want to preserve. Part of the excitement around net art has always been the widespread accessibility to its tools, or tools for creating, disseminating, and viewing it. Preserving the condition, conditions of the artwork also preserves access to it, rather than recontextualizing it in an institutional collection divorced from the world from which it came. So in short, we believe that digital art should be accessible. So this approach is not perfect, and it does have its limits. Again, Floodnet is a good example. 
We can try to recreate an environment, but sometimes we cannot fully recreate the performance of the work itself, only simulate it. So for FloodNet, we have to create like a dummy server that gets attacked in order to um, use the applet because we can't just stick it on a website. Um, but in many other cases, we are working, or in many other cases, we are working with works that have been almost entirely lost, or some that have also been censored. In these cases, this is where our community and artist-driven character comes in, and we work with artists to understand the nature of the work and the best way to adapt it to current conditions to the best of our ability. And finally, as I mentioned before, um, Old Web Today is available for public use um, at this website, oldweb.today. You can use it yourself at any point to explore web um, websites in legacy browsers. Try to find your old blog if you want to. Um, and yeah, thank you. That's it.